Welcome to our third edition of Midco Sports Magazine, where sports is the background and the stories are on people who have gone above and beyond the ordinary. They're reaching a little bit higher and giving a little bit more. We have a motorcycle mom in Mitchell and her daring daughters. A father of five trying to turn things around on the football field in Moorhead. A basketball player from Brandon who is now taking a shot at the NFL. A coach at Concordia with a World Series championship on his resume. And we start with a golden oldie, an athlete whose arm is still as good as it was when he started throwing pitches more than 60 years ago. And he is still using his gift to keep on giving. Jay Elson has his story. For Lee Goldammer, a baseball has never been far away. Goldammer began playing competitively in his hometown of Canova, South Dakota at an early age. By the time he graduated from high school in 1959, he was one of the top pitchers in the state. Professional clubs showed interest, but Goldammer's commitment to family forced his budding baseball career down a different path. Dad needed help on the farm, you know, he asked, you know, who. So, you know, it wasn't much of a decision. I stayed home and farmed. He began suiting up for the town team at age 18, beginning one of the most storied careers in South Dakota amateur baseball history. In 35 seasons, the man affectionately known as Goldie would play on six state championship teams, win over 300 games, and strike out more than 4,200 batters. He retired in 1986, only to return to the mound three years later. And now, at the age of 71, he's still throwing. I have had both hips replaced and back surgery and knee scope, that yet the arm is just like, it, it just don't hurt. I mean, I can just do it forever, so it's a gift I've been given. Ironically, Goldhammer is now using that gift to help hitters. He's been throwing batting practice for the Augustana College baseball team since 2006. Dan Richards was a coach at that time, and so I called him up if there was some way I could help, you know, just do something, you know. And then I told him batting practice, because I used to throw batting practice for the Canaries years ago. And uh, so I came out and started throwing, and, uh, and I guess that's the way it started. Goldie's participation has increased over the years. He's now tossing several times a week, and that arm, Vikings coach Tim Huber says it's just as lively as ever. I've never seen anything like it. A uh, guy his age says he's never had an arm problem in his life, and he just he just shows up and uh, he'll throw for as long as you need him to. It, it really is amazing. I throw pretty good out here. I don't lob it in there. I mean, I'm throwing it in there not full speed, but I'm. Uh, the, and they know it's going to be a strike, too, so, but they're ready. I said, you be ready to swing. It's going to be a strike. <laughs> Goldhammer knows he won't be able to say that forever, which is why he's enjoying every minute of the experience. You know, I don't think I should be throwing yet at this age, but, you know, as long as I'm able, I'm going to keep on going. Ooh, nice. Ooh, nice pitch. Good pitch, Derek. When the relationship began, no one could have predicted just how deep Goldie's impact on the program would be. I wanted to give back some to baseball. I, what level, you know, I didn't know. And then, uh, well, then I started here and the dugouts were bad and they talked about redoing dugouts and stuff. And, and then I mentioned something, you know, uh, you know, that, you know, maybe I could help Augie in some way. Goldhammer wrestled with that decision for several years before coming up with a unique way to pay it forward. I didn't really have cash to give them, but I had some land that uh, it was family farm, really. And uh, the only way I could do it is, you know, with land, and, and that's what I did. Augustana sold the land and will use the money to help fund a major renovation project at Rock and Field. A turf infield, the first of its kind in South Dakota and the NSIC, is set to be installed this summer. New dugouts, a backstop, grandstand, and press box will also be completed by the fall of 2012. Goldie's gift won't cover it all, but it certainly ensured a long-lasting legacy. My family's been a big part of baseball. They've been my number one fan all my life. So I really done it in their honor and memory of my parents and the whole family. You know, because they're the ones that, I mean, it's part of them too, you know, so. And I'm glad I did it. You know, I know my parents would be proud and, 
I know my uh, family's proud of him. We couldn't have done it without him stepping up to the plate and being that first guy to, to get us kick-started. One of these days, the good Lord up there is going to say, hey, you're going to pitch bat practice next week. You know, we need you up here. And, uh, you know, I thought, God, I want to see something when I'm here. You know, so that's why I really did it. You know, just to, I want to see it when I'm alive. After that, you know, everybody else can benefit. Jay Lee Goldhammer has given a lot to Augustana. Are there some plans for the school to honor him? Yeah, there certainly is. Uh, when, when the new grandstand is completed, they're, go, they're going to put some display of the number nine on the back of that grandstand. And, and the significance of that number is pretty simple. It's a number he's always worn throughout his career. And that's just a way of paying tribute to him for, for giving this gift. It, it, he did not give the most amount of money toward the project. However, they all say without his gift, it might not have gotten started at all. All right, thanks, good story. Thanks. When we come back, a football father who is coaching up his football family in Moorhead, Minnesota and trying to turn around that football program. Welcome back to Midco Sports Magazine. Next, we go to Moorhead, Minnesota, where losing college football games had become the norm. But a local boy has taken over as head coach, and he is now trying to light a fire under this Dragon program. Nathan Ahmet has his story. In the last decade, Winning and Minnesota State University Moorhead football have not exactly gone hand in hand. Since 2000, the Dragons won six or more games only once. Last year, Steve Lockway was hired to fix that. He got off to a rough start. The Dragons finished two and nine for the fourth consecutive season, including this NSIC opening 48 to 10 loss at home to Winona State. I felt, you know, from an outsider's perspective that there was kind of a a culture of, of, of losing, of, of learned helplessness. Culture is really kind of your habits, and your habits eventually lead you to success or they lead you to your downfall. Understand your splits now. If there's anyone to change the culture at MSU Moorhead, it's Lockway. He is deeply rooted in the region and the community. It's home. He's a native of Cavalier, North Dakota, and played his college ball at then Division II North Dakota State University. He later served as the Bison running backs and tight ends coach. In 2009 and 2010, Lockway led Fargo Shanley to back-to-back -back state titles in North Dakota Class 2A. And when the Dragons' job opened up, Lockway decided it was an opportunity he simply couldn't pass up. This was a, a great match for me professionally where I could excel. Um, but I could also win at home, which is important to me. And we have a tremendous amount of talent in this local area for the Division II level. As the, as the schools have moved to become Division I institutions in our local area, they've left kind of a void for Division II athletes. And so I think we're sitting in the middle of a gold mine for a lot of different reasons. But there is much more to Lockway than just turning around the Dragon football program. Much more. <laughs> Ready, Lockway and his wife Patty have five kids. The oldest is eight. So as you can probably imagine, things are pretty busy around the Lockway household most of the time. While Lockway was the head coach at Shanley, he also stayed home during the day with the kids. What's more, Lockway and his wife also homeschool their children. Her profession in doctoring is very hands-on. You teach and learn by doing. So she teaches the same way. I'm kind of the more traditional, you know, some rote memorization, some, you know, you need to do your math problems over and over, but that's kind of what coaching is too. You know what, we run the same play over and over to all these different things until you know it like the back of your hand. All right, Richie. Lockway says his family makes him the coach he is today. And that is echoed and reinforced in not only his love and commitment to them, but to the community he calls home and the people in it, some of whom will play for him. Lockway says it's not all about the X's and O's on the field, but rather the do's and don'ts in life. We got a coaching staff that understands that, you know, football is important. We work the job here real hard, but the other phases of our life are just as important. And I think our players need to see that because people are going to do what people see. And ultimately, we're not training them for the NFL. We're training them for the game of life. We want them to go out in the world, have a job that they're going to work hard at, 
But you know what, they're going to work hard in their family life, their social life, their, their, within their community, their church, their physical uh, health, whatever that might be, they need to be in balance. And that really is the theme of Division Two, and that's what, why I'm here, because I can do that here. Nathan, what is the number one thing that Coach Lockway is trying to do to change things on campus? Well, Tom, as you know, UND and NDSU, they've moved on to Division I, and that's really left a lot of talent behind in the Fargo-Moorhead area. Uh, they're no longer recruiting those kids, so now as Steve Lockway gets a lot of those, that untapped talent, uh, his quarterback is actually Miles Montplaisier, who was his quarterback at Shanley High School and Lockway coach there, so he's really taken advantage of the recruiting situation. All right, we wish him well. Thank you. Thank you. We stay in Moorhead for our next story. Up next, a coach at Concordia who ran down a World Series dream. A lot of his dream of being a pro athlete and making it to the top of the sports world. And as Dan Aspen shows us, one Fargo native dreamed that dream and then he got it done. Not very often can you find a World Series champion on the coaching staff of a Division III college baseball program. But for Chris Coast, there isn't any other place he'd rather be. A Fargo native who played his college ball here at Concordia College in Moorhead, Minnesota, Coast never had a doubt about where life was going to take him. I think since I was four or five years old, my first memories were watching my grandfather play softball. And my grandfather wasn't a great athlete, but to me, I thought he was the best player in the world, so I wanted to be like him. Being a baseball player was my identity from the age of five years old. His ambitions set at such a young age, Coast grew up with a mentality that defined his style of play. He said many times over the course of his career for, for them to make me quit playing this game, they're gonna have to rip this jersey off my back. Bucky Burgal knows baseball. He's now in his 35th season as the Cobbers manager, and he had a front row seat for Coast's record-breaking career at Concordia. He could do it all. He could swing it, fielding ground balls. The ball always stayed in his glove and never bounced out. And he's one of the best guys I've ever coached as far as getting the ball out of the glove and the ball on its way. He was a clutch performer. Coast set 15 records at Concordia as a third baseman and a closer. After his college career, he played 11 years in the minor leagues before getting called up to the majors as a member of the Philadelphia Phillies. When I got the call that I was going to the big leagues, honestly, I didn't believe it because I'd had many dreams leading up to that for many years. Like I'd wake up and I'd in my bed and I'd be, you know, it'd be a January day in Fargo and it'd be snowing out and I'd be mad because I thought my dream was real. So when I got the call, I was pinching myself like there's no, there's no way this is happening. It's a dream. In retrospect, Coe's promotion to the big leagues was just the first in a series of his dreams becoming reality. Curveball struck in loud. Swing and a line drive towards straightaway center field. That's going to win it for the Bills. What a comeback. Four hits off the bench for Chris Coast. In 2008, Coast and the Phillies were just four wins away from fulfilling the ultimate dream as they faced off with the Tampa Bay Rays in the World Series. Coast was in the starting lineup for game one as the Phillies designated hitter. How I found out, oddly enough, was I had done phone interviews through baseball tonight, so the producer had my number and he sends me a text message and says, Chris, if you guys win game one, will you come on the show tomorrow on, the, on do a phone interview? And I'm like, I don't even know I'm starting. So I type back in, I'm, how do you know I'm starting? He's like, I got the lineups in front of me, you're starting. So I found out I was starting game one from a producer at ESPN. The Phillies won the World Series in five games and Coast and his teammates paraded down Broad Street. After waiting more than a decade to get his shot in the majors, he was now defined as one of the few people to reach baseball's pinnacle. The only way I could equate it was, imagine you won the lottery for $600 million. The disbelief you would have, there's no way this is happening to me. When we're in the dog pile in the mound, that's what it felt like. There's no way this is possibly happening. He started out as a kid with the dreams of playing in the big leagues. He ended up as a man with a World Series ring. And after his playing days were cut short by injuries, Coast began a new career in baseball. I was always preparing for a life after baseball in baseball as a coach or manager because I played, I played baseball all over, all over the world. I played every level a person possibly could play at, whether it's the lowest of independent baseball to AAA to the World Series. So now Chris Coast is back home, not behind the plate, but at Concordia. 
He's working with Burgau on continuing the Cobra legacy that began 35 years ago. He's bringing a vast uh, amount of baseball experience to our program. He's seen uh, baseball and learned baseball that I or some of the players have never seen before. And as for Coast, his future in baseball isn't nearly as unpredictable as it once was. My thought was if I take over for Bucky one day, I want to be like he did and uh, do it like he did, and that is be here for 30 some years until it's time to, to retire and get on with life. So if I'm a coach, it'll be at Concordia. Dan, Coach seems locked in now at Concordia, but did he ever want to coach anywhere else at any time? Initially, Tom, yeah, he was thinking of working his way up through the coaching system, starting in the minor leagues, uh, much like he did as a player. Yeah. But now that he's got a, a family, a wife and daughters that uh, he's spending a lot of time with, he's really trying to keep it close to home, as you saw at the end of the piece. And uh, as a coach, he's going to stay close to home at Concordia. All right. Thanks, Dano. A little later, another Dakota native taking a shot at the pros in a sport that was his second choice in college. But next, it is time for the Clocks, a fast family of motorcycle racers helping troubled kids in Mitchell. Well, what kind of mother would let her daughters ride 200 miles an hour on a motorcycle? Well, a mom that has set some land speed records herself. We go to Mitchell, South Dakota, where Joe Beltram has the story on some speedy sisters and a mom who is using horsepower to help them and others. The Bonneville Salt Flats, 30,000 acres of salt, sweat, and speed. This is where the fearless race against time to see who can be the fastest ever. People are here to do things others say is impossible. Now it's Laura Clock's turn. A biker mom from Mitchell about to do something she's never even tried before. Her husband's competing in a national biker build off and needs someone to ride his newest creation. And he said, no, I, I really think it would be smarter. We'd get more attention with it if you raced it. Would you do it? And I said, I said, would you let me? <laughs> so um, that's how it was decided. We won the biker build off. Three weeks later, um, we were on the starting line in Bonneville Salt Flats. Clock sets a land speed record her first time out. It's the start of a new family tradition. I thought, well, the girls kind of have shown an interest. Maybe they'd want to try this. And before I even had it all the way out, the, my, out of my mouth, they're like, yeah, we want to try it. We want to try it. The next year, 16-year-old Erica Clock sets a record of her own. And Erica and Laura are the first mother-daughter team in history to hold land speed records. Then, 14-year-old Carly becomes the youngest land speed record holder ever. But there's a catch. She had to take her sister's record to do that because her sister had ridden that bike the year before. Like mother, like daughter, like kid sister, before they can be the best in the world, they need to be the best in their family. It's this once or twice a year thing where it's like extreme family bonding because it is extreme. You're doing something that's dangerous. You know, you have to endure the heat and each other. This year, the trio hopes to be the first mother-daughter-daughter -daughter team to ride the same bike 200 miles per hour. They were close last year, but you might be thinking, isn't this crazy? I feel like, yes, we get going pretty fast, but it's a very controlled environment. To me, it's kind of like sending them off into life. You know, you, you teach them everything that you know, and you kiss them on the helmet and say a prayer for them and send them down the track, and you hope that they remember everything you taught them. But I can't think of another way that I could have taught them how to challenge themselves, how to work as a team, how to handle success and handle failure. And Clock takes that message to other girls. The Abbott House in Mitchell, South Dakota is home to dozens of abused girls who need help. And Laura has a unique way to do just that. Woke up one morning with this idea, what if we took a damaged motorcycle into the, into the facility because they're in there working on the damage in their lives and we could fix the damage on this motorcycle and just relate it to life. The girls work in teams to bring a bike back to life from a beaten up mess to this. In the beginning, I hear a lot of, I can't, I've never done that before. And really after about the third class, um, 
I don't think I touched a tool again. I got to watch them just realize things about themselves. I mean, the self-discovery was pretty amazing, just trying something and realizing, hey, I can do that, you know? And most of our kids are coming here. Um, many of them have really difficult backgrounds, having some, some things that have happened really in their lives that help to drive some of the things that they do today. Um, and so that message is important to them. Some of us haven't had people before, or we've just had some really hard times. And when we see that people are helping us, there's like a little bit of hope, I guess. And when help leads to hope, it doesn't matter if you're a kid trying to cope with the ugly parts of life or a small town biker mom with a dream. By trying something new, sometimes impossible doesn't seem all that impossible. Joe, the Clock family will set up shop at the Rally in Sturgis this year, right? They've got a lot of new products to show off. Yeah, well, Brian and Laura Clock are being uh, inducted into the Sturgis Hall of Fame, which is a tremendous honor. They got over 350 parts. Their main part up there is their patent flare windshield, Tom. This thing, they get a lot of people that will, they will let them try it on their bike and then next thing you know, they ride it for a little while, they bring it back and say, I want to purchase this. So Tom, you bring your Hardly Roadster up there and you purchase one. All right, thanks, Joe. When we come back, the Daily Double, a two sports star at South Dakota State trying to catch on in the National Football League. Welcome back. Well, why would a kid who played four years of college basketball now be in Green Bay trying to make it as a pro football player? Because Dale Moss is that kind of athlete. Oh, to be this kind of athlete, the kind that can make any sport look like he was born to play it, the kind with the ability to throw down a nasty follow-up jam and make that look as easy as an over-the-middle catch and a sprint to the end zone. This kind of athlete is Dale Moss, six foot three and 220 pounds of human physical performance. Touchdown, Dale Moss! Moss was a great high school football player, 45 catches and 10 touchdowns as Brandon Valley made the state semifinals in his senior season in 2006. But he was just as good in basketball, and when it came time to decide which sport to play in college, his heart said hoops. Well, basketball was always my first love, and uh, Coach Nagy and the staff, uh, they did a great job during the recruiting process. and. Uh, you know, I, I love football too, um, but it kind of goes back to basketball. It was just something, you know, I always felt really comfortable with. And he was good. Played all four years, started as a senior, eight points, five rebounds per game. And when it was over, he was done with basketball. But NCAA rules give you five years to compete, which meant Moss could put away the sneakers and put on the helmet and pads if he wanted to. And he wanted to. He had stayed in touch with the football coaches who recruited him, and in the spring of last year, he decided to give it a shot. You know, just in case he was still pretty good at it, which he was. After the first few days, I knew I could make plays on the ball. Um, you know, learning the plays and the footwork and everything, that, that was a grind, but um, I had the whole summer to prepare for the fall camp and the season. After easing his way into the starting lineup in the third game of the year, Moss took off tied for the team lead with 61 catches and showed off that incredible athletic ability. Once things kind of started going uh, and I started having some success during the season, uh, you know, I felt like maybe this is a possibility, you know, I'm doing the right thing and uh, I might have a shot to play after this year. When the season ended, Moss hired an agent, stayed in shape and set out to prove that even with his limited college experience, he could play wide receiver in the NFL. He was not invited to the NFL Combine in February, which in hindsight was a big oversight. Because in March, Moss worked out for Pro Scouts at the Dakota Dome. He ran the 40 in 4.48 seconds. His vertical leap was 41 and a half inches. His three cone drill was off the charts. And in fact, his times and marks would have been some of the best, and in some cases, the best of all the guys who did go to the Combine. My high school coach uh, always said the things you appreciate most in life are the things you work hardest for. And that's how I was raised. That's, that's how I really uh, like to pride myself. So um, it's going to be a challenge. Proving people wrong, I'm OK with that. Uh, I, I'm confident in what I can do. I have great support system. 
and I just got to work hard and the rest will fall into place. Moss continues to work as hard as he can, fighting off an illness on this bright April day to sharpen his step and refine his routes, all the while keeping in mind how far he has come and how far he has to go. A lot of people are thinking, all right, this is a developmental guy, um, you know, which in some terms, yeah, you know, I still have things to learn in, uh, as far as the game goes, but um, I want to surprise people. You know, I feel like I've done it uh, periodically every step of the way, and, uh, you know, I, I, keep want, I want to keep doing it. Um, I, want to, I want to be a guy who can contribute to a team. I don't want to just make a roster. So every time I step out on the field, whether it's a workout or whatever, you know, I'm trying to get perfect reps, uh, just really work hard and um, just leave it all out there. Well, he is determined to prove people wrong. Moss was not picked in the NFL draft this year, but he did sign a free agent contract with the Packers. And you can follow him. He's very social media savvy. Follow him on Twitter to keep up to date on his progress with the Packers. Thank you for watching Midco Sports Magazine.